This podcast is for individuals who want to be transformed in their lives by listening to specific guests in the fields of faith, family, fitness, and freedom. As a teacher, life coach, husband, father, author, and founder of 40 Days of Deliverance, my intention with each podcast is to help you grow in these specific areas. Lastly, my hope is that you will begin to learn specific habits to introduce to your lifestyle said so you can live a purposeful life that you feel fulfilled. I love you and may the Lord bless you and keep you all the days of your life. Another order of business. I wrote a book called Freedom to Ascend, which is on sale now on Amazon.com. I will send a link in my show notes, so just click on it. It's a great price. It's a great read. So pick one up today. Another item of order, land. The Lord has given me a vision that I will be gifted land by some special soul. And this land will be used for deliverance camps to help people who are hurting and to help people come together as a family and friends and fellowship. So if you have land that you would love to donate for this cause, please go to the show notes, which I'll have my email and just email me land. Another note, share this episode. This show is growing. And the only way it's going to grow faster is if you can do one thing, share this episode with one friend or more. Also, if you haven't left a review, do that now as well. Just do it on your app you're listening to. Now buckle up and enjoy this episode. Hey, welcome to the John Gardena Classroom. Today is a special day as we have Brad Ritter from the School of Grit on, and you are going to just be in awe of what he has gone through, um, through his journey of life, through this uh, Kokoro camp that he went through in 2015. He is a, a great family man. He is a leader in his community and his family as well, and he inspires each of us every single day by what he does, um, by his daily actions. So, Brad, thank you so much for being on today. Yeah, thanks, John. Appreciate it, brother. Looking forward to this, man. That'll be great, man. So I'm going to start off just into the classroom. We always like to ask a couple questions. So the first question I have for you is, if you were a superhero, what would your superpower be? Oh, man, that's a good one. I haven't been in the classroom in a while, so I'm a little scared of what these questions might be. But a superpower, how about the ability to fly like it get anywhere you want fast no traffic great <laughs> yeah no traffic that's right close all right second man. would be the uh, close second would be the healing powers of uh wolverine i think that'd be pretty cool that too. would be awesome i agree with that <laughs> that would be awesome i, I agree 100 percent with that one all right as an author of the book school of grit and you can't use your book but what is your favorite book that you have read <laughs> Oh, man. Here recently, we were just talking about before the show, um, probably David Goggins' Can't Hurt Me back in 2019. It's 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 one of those books that I probably pull out still once a year and, and reread. Or if I find myself, um, you know, running a race, for instance, or doing something really, really hard, I'll listen to his audio book because his audio book is so, so good. So the first one and the second one or both doesn't matter. Um, the first one, I like the second one too, but the first one's the one that started all for me. So I keep going back to that one. I would agree with that as well. I, I, I've read the first one. Can't hurt me. And the second book, I'm, I can't remember the, the title of it right now. Um, but I, I listened to that one and I would still say the first one was, it was better. Maybe it just yeah. cause it, it woke in my soul to what yeah. I was able to do. And then the second was just a reinforcer that w was already convicted from what I heard from him in the first place. But Brad, Completely I like you already. We're on the, <laughs> it's my top five book of all time. Can't Hurt Me by David Goggins. All right. You're doing great so far. Now we're going back in school. So who was your favorite teacher? Oh my gosh. My favorite teacher, probably Mrs. Ross back in fifth grade. She just had this. Uh, just uncanny nature about her, like very uh, welcoming and would actually take the time to listen to you. Yeah. So shout out 
Mrs. Ross, if you're out there, St. Jude, nice. grade. All right, Mrs. Ross, shout out to you. Awesome. It's always nice to do that because I think sometimes teachers that who have had an impact in your life, um, just just at the same time as well, people who have maybe impacted your life that we never expressed that. So that gratitude today of telling Mrs. Ross that she was the best of all your 12 years, that's that's a shout out to her. So appreciate that, Brad. All right. If you could go anywhere in the world, where would you go? Somewhere where there's a beach, tropical. I'd probably say Hawaii because that's just been on the bucket list for a while, and and the wife and I haven't haven't been, but we've been talking about trying to make that happen here in the next you know five to ten. So I'm gonna go with Hawaii. All right, I've never been there. I heard it's beautiful, so yeah, like I would second that. Yeah, I would second that place as well. All right, this is more a little deeper question. What do you want to hear from God when you meet Him in heaven? That I lived up to my full potential and accomplish what he had planned somehow, some way through, through the ups and downs. I, I found my way. Perfect. Yeah. Great. Great answer, Brad. Well, I think you passed the test five out of five. So as our little, uh, pre-introduction quiz, we're going to roll right into it now. So, you know, reading your book, the school of grit, um, and I told you pre-interview of this was, I thought it was amazing. And the reason why was that I was drawn to who you become or became during this journey, this transformation. So let's give everyone who hasn't read it just a little bit of a, a pre-2015 Brad Ritter and kind of like living in the comfort of just life. So just give a little bit of breakdown of how that looked for you. Yeah, I'll give you a, a kind of a quick breakdown. So, uh, born and raised Indiana, Midwest, Midwestern guy, Midwestern roots, uh, middle class, white guy. Uh, we weren't rich, we weren't poor. I knew the difference between both. Um, grew up with a very loving family, very fortunate. Um, parents are still married, um, and I'm the oldest of four kids. And we're all pretty, pretty close. I mean, we get together still for, on the holidays and talk to one another, although it's more like texting now instead of talking as we've gotten older. But um, just very, very, uh, very, I had a great childhood, man. Um, not that, you know, I didn't have, you know, bullies and things like that that you might encounter. But all in all, it was, it was, it was a great, great childhood and um, played sports, played baseball basketball, a little bit of football, as to say, I played one year, <laughs> uh, but, but loved baseball and, um, you know, just kind of moved through high school. And, you know, if I was to tell you the truth in high school, I, um, didn't push myself very hard. Uh, grades kind of came a little bit easier. It wasn't too hard for me to, you know, make a B and just kind of coast through class, that sort of thing. Um, you know, had, had some friends, in high school that later um i had to kind of leave um they were just kind of bringing me down and had to have that kind of heart to heart with myself and uh, ended up going to college and then um you know luckily met my wife when i was uh, in my senior year of college which was which was super cool yeah i'm gonna stop you there i'm gonna stop you there because it sounds very similar parallels to to how i was raised almost identical brad I'm one of four. I'm not the oldest. Secondly, I played college baseball. Baseball was your your sport. Yeah. What, what and position? Third, I I was a pitcher in uh, college. I so, was a pitcher and shortstop in high school. That's what so. that's what I was too in high school. Yeah. See, I knew there was a connection. That's it. I knew there was a connection. Thanks, Javier Mesa, for uh, bringing us together tonight. <laughs> and I also met my wife my senior year of college as well. So That's awesome. blessed beyond belief. So continue. Yeah, this is great that you found yeah, the right woman at the right time. Stop me wherever. Cause I, I, I love that going off um, on stuff like that and, and finding commonality, common ground. So, um, so yeah, college didn't know what I wanted to do uh, when, when I grew up. So my dad um, led me to, let me back up there. I almost joined the military. So out of, out of uh, my senior year, my best friend at the time, um, his dad, uh, was a decorated um, 
army guy fought in Vietnam War. And uh, I was this close, man, to signing up. And I chickened out, dude. I chickened out. I, did, I didn't do it. I, he, he signed up, and, uh, and I went to college. He's still in today, so shout out to uh, my best friend, Josh Brown. Uh, he's a command sergeant major now. And so he's, you know, pretty high up. And I always wonder, you know, kind of like, man, what, 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 what if? if, you know, what well, if? Like, Brad. And, and, and I think it's that piece of serving too, you know, like, mm-hmm. I, like I missed out on, you know, being a leader and serving people and all that good stuff. Well, again, here's another parallel is that my junior year of college, this was in 2003. So this, we were, remember bombing Iraq that yep. spring i'll never forget it and then same thing went to recruiter and i almost signed up for the army uh knowing i had one more year of college and i prayed about it and um god told me to just just be patient and then i met my wife and then we we, we decided that you know what we were going to get married shortly after yep. and engaged and start a family so if it wasn't for her um definitely would have been in the army and there was that purpose, too, of serving in what if, what if I did serve? Because I always wanted to serve my country. And that's the only regret I have in my life. Um, but for you, Brad, it's it's crazy to, to think that you were this. So the year that you almost joined, what, what year was that for you? Well, I would have, I graduated in 97. So, you know, I would have, I would have been in and then, you know, yeah. 2001, it's, mm-hmm. you'd be going to war. Because I was going yeah. infantry, infantry all the way, maybe even a mm-hmm. ranger. That's mm-hmm. uh, yeah, that was that was the path. If I if I was going to get in, that's what I was going to try and do. Man, that's crazy. That's the same yeah. path I was going to go. It's wild. I isn't swear it? to you, man. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're cut from the same cloth of of what we hard work, service, um, value of our country, yeah. patriotism, you know, patriotism. Yeah, the whole yep. the whole deal, man. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Keep going. And this then, is great. And, yeah, this is awesome. And then um, grew up Catholic too. I I don't know why I forgot to mention that, but grew up Catholic. Catholic grew went up. to a Catholic grade school, one through eight, but went to a public high school. Man, mm-hmm. and that was a shock, like culture mm-hmm. shock. Because man, when I was in Catholic grade school, dude, I mean, I my principal was a nun, Sister James Michael. Shout out to her, and uh, she had the paddle. There in her oh, yeah. in her office, like if you stepped out of line, man, you got paddled. You know, like there mm-hmm. were just certain things that happened back then when we were in school, and uh, yeah, somewhere along the line, though, I um, I think it's when I started working in in high school because I was working on the weekends. I stopped going to church, man. Just kind of kind of fell out of the uh, uh, of going to church thing. You know, still believe in God and and all that good mm-hmm. stuff, but um, just kind of fell out of going to church. So. Were you going to say something? I, you look like you are going to stop me there for a second. No, no. I'm just saying that I, I was raised Catholic. I, okay. I, can st- I continue one. to practice my faith in, in Catholicism. And the one thing I will tell you is that um, there was a point maybe like six, seven years ago where I thought I would go to be like a Baptist or, you know, become a pastor. Um, but long story short, I listened to the catechism in a year, and, and I still am right now with Father Michael Schmitz from Minnesota. And it's so nice to know your faith from re- the origins to reaffirm um, your faith, the, the foundational beliefs of mm-hmm. the Roman Catholic faith, which was the beginning with Peter, obviously, as the Pope. But it, it was it is so nice. And I would just say that to you, like if— I'm not here to to tell you what denomination is the best because God doesn't have a chart in heaven to say you're in the right denomination to go to heaven. I'll just tell everyone that right now. But um, I do think it's very important to um, be in the right value system to where you are in your faith and have that relationship with Jesus, which is the most important um, for for your eternal uh, salvation. So, you know, I think it's very important for all of us. And I know faith is important to you um, and your family. So go ahead, keep going. This is great, man. Yeah, man, we're rolling. So yeah, raised, raised Catholic and, you know, went to, I mean, we had a, a, a religion class and, you know, of mm-hmm. course went to church on Sundays and, and then all that good stuff. But then slowly over time, I just, like I said, I found myself, um, wasn't going to church anymore and wasn't really talking to God mm-hmm. as much as I had when I was, when I was raised. And that'll come back up, I'm sure, as we get to talking about um, Kokoro Camp and some other stuff. But um, so I'll pause on the on the religion piece. But 
So college, went through college, graduated with a business degree just because I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. And uh, my dad guided me on that one, said, well, if you get a business degree, you know, there's a lot of things you can do with that. So thanks for the advice, dad, on that one. And, um, you know, for whatever reason, I was I was motivated by money, man. I wanted to get out and make make some change, you know. Um, so what happens? I, I, I've got a degree and I went on interviews and no one hired me. They all said, you need experience. And I'm like, well, how do you get, exp-, you know, how do I get experience? You got to take a chance on someone. So dude, man, talk about humble pie. I was working at FedEx, the night shift, working, clocking in at 11 o'clock, working until 3 a.m. just for insurance. I was doing that at night. And then uh, during the day, I worked a marketing internship. And when I say marketing internship, I was in a cubicle on the phone, like making cold calls. It was ho- it was horrible. Like that year of my life, like, and my wife would even, she remembers just, I looked like crap. You know, I wasn't working out. I was working all these hours. I wasn't getting, I was getting some sleep, but it came in different, um, you know, intervals. And it was, it's what I needed though. Um, mm-hmm. quite frankly, it's, it was a blessing because it was humble pie. I graduated and had a chip on my shoulder and thought like, you know, the world owes me something now. And it's like, that's just not how it is. The world doesn't owe you well, anything. That's exactly right. And as a teacher, and I think a lot of children growing up, young adults, they think that when they get out of high school or college, that that instant gratification of a big paying job is right there at the foot of their footstep. And that's a lie. So everyone, everyone needs to know competition still exists in the world, especially in the United States. And you have to have a work ethic and a vision for what you want in life and have relationships and communicate well with people to have a prosperous career. Unless unless, there are careers, obviously you don't have to talk to people, but you still got to work hard if you want to amount to uh, your value for whatever company hires you. So continue, Brad. This is great. Absolutely, man. So huge proponent of that. Um, so, you know, I was grinding and then finally, um, someone took a chance on me and, and, and got a job at, uh, Xerox. So I was, it was my first like real sales, um, career. And it was, it was pretty cutthroat, man. I learned a lot there. It was, it was awesome. Like their sales training was unbelievable. They sent you for three weeks to a place called, uh, Leesburg, Virginia. You're like back in the dorm. I mean, it was, you didn't get, you didn't go home on the weekend and you, you learned all about like their equipment, how they wanted you to sell. And then there was like a couple day practicum at the end. I mean, it was the real deal. It was awesome. So did Xerox for, boot camp, huh? Xerox boot camp, dude. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, it was awesome. And, uh, you know, did that for a few years and I had a buddy that was in medical sales. He's like, man, I think you'd like it over in here. So, um, so I was in medical sales for a while, but, um, Got burnt out, made a lot of money, but got burnt out. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I ended up working for this one company. I won't name their name, but um, I was on call. I'd never been on call. Um, it's horrible if you have a family. It just, just is. I was literally trading family time for money. And uh, not a good, yeah, not not, not, not a fun. good way to live. No, not no fun. freedom. A right. slave to the job. Man. Yep. Yep. And, and why is that? It's because I was, I was misguided. I was chasing money instead of really trying to find, you know, passion, purpose, all that, all that, all that good stuff. And then, um, kind of had this, well, let me back up. I, uh, ended up getting fired from said company, uh, which was tough pill for me to swallow. <clears throat> In fact, I would, I used to tell people I got laid off cause I just ego, right? Mm-hmm. No, nah, I got fired. Absolutely got fired. Uh, nothing I really quote unquote did wrong, just clashed with uh, management and, and, and stuff like that. And uh, through luck, ran to one of my best friends from high school at uh, at a Sears AutoZone, which doesn't even exist anymore. Like Sears. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like not around. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, not at all, man. Yeah. He's talking to me about um, the publishing industry, but working for uh, McGraw or Pearson Education at the time, mm-hmm. like one of the higher ed, I was like, people get paid to sell books to professors. He's like, yeah, dude, it's an awesome job. I was like, I'm in. And man, I, that was, that was uh, one of the best careers I ever had in my life. Did that for about 12 years. Uh, but along the way, <clears throat> that's a really long story to get to where 
like this pivotal point was like pre 2015, right? Which is, which is yeah. what I'm trying to do. Your right awakening. Now. Yeah. My awakening. So one day that's exactly what happened. I woke up, was getting ready for school. Nothing major. Kid, kids went off. Uh, wife went to, she's a teacher. So she went to go teach and I'm by myself uh, shaving and I'm looking in the mirror, man. And you know, everybody's got this voice inside of them. And this one was just loud. It was louder than it had ever been. And it was basically saying like, what are you doing with your life? And I couldn't answer it. I, I had no answer speechless. And I actually took a uh, mental sick day that day, called in from work and I just, I stayed home. <clears throat> wasn't really sick, but just mentally, I knew I needed some time and I actually took action on it and dug in. And the way I dug in was through the internet, of course. So I started typing in, you know, how to find your purpose and this, that, and the other. And there was a bazillion hits and I spent hours just reading blogs and all kinds of stuff. And at the end of that time, I wasn't anywhere closer to, to, to solving that particular riddle. And, um, I love watching, um, video. Like I go to YouTube all the time, learn how to tinker around with things. Oh yeah, I do too. All, all the time. And YouTube's so went, great, man. Yeah. I love it. So I went on and, and typed in the same thing, like how to find purpose. And in the top five hits, um, this psychologist pops up. Her name's Angela Duckworth. And she wrote a book called Grit. And I don't know if you're familiar with the book, but um, I read it. Yep. She, she delivered a, a, a TED talk. You can it's still up. And it's got millions and millions of views. But she talks about grit and why it's important. <clears throat> and she goes on to say that, you know, through her research, it's the leading indicator or one of the leading indicators of success in life. And it's like, who doesn't want to be successful in life? I mean, that's what I was looking at. But what is the definition of success? That's different to everybody. And I thought, man, she's on to something. So I saw her, I bought her book, read it like cover to cover. And uh, basically, you can grow grit two ways. You can grow it from the inside out. You can grow it from the outside in. And she gives a scale that you can, or this test, basically, 10 questions you can take. And I scored, um, out of a possible five, I scored a 2.2, which was, I was like grittier than 20% of the most people that, you know, take that survey. And I'm pretty yeah. competitive dude by nature. And I thought there's no way that's How that's mad did possible. that make you when, when you got those mad. results? Made me feel this yeah. big. But I started going back through the questions <clears throat> and they were questions like, you know, if you, if you work on a project, do you finish it or do you move on to the next one? I had, I oftentimes had shiny object syndrome. Um, I would start things and not finish them. I would move on mm. good intentions, but wouldn't finish it and things like that. And I thought, you know, maybe, I think she's on to something. So um, I'm at this point where I'm trying to find grit and I'm think I'm, I'm like, how, what's the best avenue for me? Well, one of the ways to do it's um, from the outside in, which involves, um, either finding coaches, mentors, people who can help you along your way, or purposely putting yourself in a place where you're just going to get thrown in and it's going to happen. So I went back to YouTube because I'd had success with that. And I typed in world's toughest civilian training. And that's when Kokoro camp pops up. So that was my, you, you'd asked like the pre version, right? To 2015. So I just kind of brought you up to like, that's when I saw this camp, you know? Yeah. And it's amazing how, and we'll use uh, your favorite book in mine as well, uh, David Goggins. And we'll use, again, the connection here is when he was just sick of working at Eco Labs. And, yeah. you know, I think he watched uh, um, a documentary on the Navy SEALs. And then he's like, that's it. I'm going to do it. And he went to recruiter and like, you're too fat. Like, there's no way. And then that one guy said, well, if you got three months and you could shed a hundred pounds and we'll, we'll definitely see if you could come in. Well, for you, you didn't have to shed that much weight, probably not, not much at all. But the point, the point is this, right, Brad, is that what happens is your subconscious on that mirror, that visit to the mirror said to yourself, what are you doing in your life? And who are you? that identity crisis almost not that you're a bad guy, not that you were a bad father, bad uh, spouse, but you 
maybe have lacked fulfillment and purpose. So you researching YouTube, and this is great for everybody. You may be in the same situation Brad was, maybe the same situation I was before 2019, before I had my awakening. And you're thinking to yourself like, man, I just don't feel like every day when I get up, I have a a real divine purpose or a real, like a making an impact in the world. And what Brad did was everyone has access, right? Go to YouTube and type in something that you're seeking and then you will find results. So Angela Duckwork, uh, Grit, and then Kokoro Camp. And then that's kind of how it led where you were just, you were so that, and we have that background of that military that that discipline that your soul and mine as well like we we seek that discipline is great for the soul and then allowing it to manifest within your heart and then talking with your wife about it and then saying like i need i need this like i need i really need this so go ahead talk about that no, that that's it and um i would throw another piece in there too and that is adversity through my research and, you know, looking online, you know, you hear about a lot of these motivational speeches and speakers like Goggins or whoever. It's like they all have these incredible backgrounds. They've all usually gone through a load of adversity, trauma, whatever you want to call it. I didn't, man. Not really. Like I said, I had a great childhood, dude. I mean, I didn't have to worry about food being put on the table. I didn't have to battle cancer. I didn't have to deploy. I didn't have a bunch of people close to me die. I was very fortunate. I'm not saying I want that. But you learn a lot about yourself when you go through adversity. I came to a realization. I think I think Goggins even kind of put in his book somewhere. I'd have to try and find it. But um, I, I just came up with the realization, man, my life has been a little bit too soft. I need it. Yeah. I need it. Well, in your book, you wrote this. This is perfect. Adversity is the key ingredient to grow grit and resiliency. Your new mission was to bring adversity to yourself rather than wait for it. You call it purposeful pain. So talk a little bit about that purposeful pain. Purposeful pain. Yeah. So it's the, it's the stuff. When you think of purposeful pain and you say that to yourself, you're probably immediately going to have some thoughts some things that might pop into your head. And if it's stuff that scares you, but it's good for you, you should probably do it. Just mm-hmm. throwing it out there. You should probably do it. You know, you're going to learn a lot about yourself. You're going to grow. You're going to build your mental toughness, your emotional resiliency. And at the end of the day, it's probably going to give you a pretty damn cool story to tell um, others. So I encourage everybody to do it. I'm not, t- I'm, and notice I said good for you. I'm not telling you to put yourself in harm's way on purpose. Um, so make sure it's well thought out. But, you know, if there's something that, that fits the bill, like let's put public speaking out there. I know a lot of people are scared to, you know, get up in front of an audience, let's say, and deliver a speech. Well, I say go do it. You're going to learn a lot. And the more you do it, the easier it becomes. So, Well, another thing to add on top of that, and I think this is great for everybody, is fear stops the action for your passion. And I think what I've learned about fear is um, personally is that if once you let fear creep in to your mind, then all the things that you know are going to benefit you, they stop there because you stop your action. Just like public speaking, you know, it will help you grow, you know, going through your camp that you went through, um, going through maybe maybe just studying or researching. You know it's a long haul, but at the end of the day, you know it's going to benefit you in your life and be fulfilled to teach others. So, you know, Brad, let's, let's dive into then where you said, you know what, Roger, that I I need this purposeful pain. And I wanted the toughest civilian camp there was, and you found Kokoro camp. So go ahead, talk about that. Yeah, I will. Um, you you hit something real quick though. I want to expand on, I think it's important. And, and, um, and I love talking about fear. Um, it's to me, it's the ultimate F word. You know, and, mm-hmm. and, I, and I write about that, right? It it, uh, it dictates pretty much everything you do in life from, you know, being on a podcast, let's say, or uh, asking so-and-so out to the prom or asking for a promotion at work or, you know, it's just that kind of fear of failure. Um, I, I had someone tell me a while back that um, they, they changed my whole mindset on, on, on fear. And that is this simple little fact that um, fear and courage go hand in hand. And why do they go hand in hand? Well, those who are the most fearful have the opportunity to show the most courage. Everybody's scared of something. There's no one out there that's like, yeah, I'm not scared of anything. Well, they're lying. 
They were scared of something, mm-hmm. whatever that is. Absolutely. But yeah. change your mindset around it and say, okay, yeah, I'm scared to do this, but I'm, I get a chance here to show courage. It, you kind of look at it a little bit differently. You know what I mean? And and I use the analogy of like my wife, she's deathly afraid of snakes. Okay. And we went walking down a trail uh, a couple years ago when my kids were little and a snake went by and she freaked out and and left us me with 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 my little kids now i'm not afraid of snakes so i'd have no problem you know moving that snake along or just standing my ground so i like that i would ask you like am i showing courage in that situation i would say no because i'm not scared to do it right but if she was in that situation being scared of snakes and she stood her ground or shoot it away would she be showing courage I'd say, heck yeah, because she's scared of doing it. So the two, the two are there, right? They are, they are intertwined. Oh, that's good, Brad. And I think more people need to understand that. Like, if you let fear dictate your life, then you're not going to live a fulfilled life. And I think fulfillment is what ultimately we all seek. And fulfillment is knowing that you have a mission and passion in life, and you're pursuing that, even knowing you're going to have adversity and face fears that you that succumb or they come to the surface finally and i always say like punch your fears in the face and just knock them down and get to the next door and let's go like it's go time because we only have one life we do not know how many years we'll be on this earth so either get busy living or get busy dying right shawshank redemption shawshank redemption (laughs) yep so basically you know courage can't exist without fear is what i like to say Mm -hmm. there at, at the end of the day, so start thinking about it like that. It's like, okay, yeah, I just have an opportunity to show courage. Yeah. And then, you know, you've got kids. So it's like, we try to teach those as dads, we try to teach those principles to our own kids, you know, in, in their everyday school, sports, whatever. Yeah. I think um, I'm reading a great book right now and I recommend everyone read it. It's uh, by Rob Dial called Level Up. He's the number one mindset mentor. And uh, the first chapter is all about fear. And it's a a belief system that we have about certain things. So again, once fear suffocates your mind, then there's no forward action to what you can achieve. And we're really hammering this point, but it's so true. I mean, everyone listening right now, like, think about that one fear that you have. I don't care how old you are, that has chained you to the ground, literally. Yeah. From moving forward in your life to where you think you could have been or should be but you're letting it dictate your future and that's that's terrible that's an apostasy for for how to live life you know it's, There's no it's freedom so important in yeah and i know we're i know we're beating this point into the ground but so important had i not um shown courage and signed up for kokoro camp which is what we're getting ready to talk about i wouldn't be here talking to you right now no. All that stuff has transpired because I showed courage and signed up when other people thought I was crazy. They were questioning why I was doing it. I questioned whether I could do it. And look, you throw. Sometimes you just got to throw the chips in, man, and go. And you're gonna learn. Even if I did, even if I would have signed up and failed, I still would have learned a ton about myself. And who knows? Maybe 100%. I would have gone back. No, I mean, you know what I what I got through your book, and I, I'm actually going to go. Just for time's sake, we, we, we have a lot of stuff to cover. Um, you know, when you signed up and there all that fear and you, you just trained your ass off, like you literally had this program dialed in. Um, what was the name of the program that you used again to, to prepare for it? So I actually used to, I, I used um, Seal Fit. There's a company called Seal Fit out there and they post something called an OPWOD, which stands for Operator WOD. The, these are typically workouts that, um, you know, your, your special forces types of people are, are going to do. They're typically about three hours in length and uh, they're designed just to crush your soul every time. So I did that three to four times a, a week. And then I mixed that in with um, a company called Seal Grinder PT. Shout out to Brad McLeod and uh, his, his workouts basically based on body weight. Cause I knew, I knew going out there, like they're not going to make me bench press a deadlift, mm-hmm. but I'm going to have to do a lot of calisthenics. So I better get good at doing calisthenics. So it was a lot of body weight, um, you know, rucking all that good stuff. Yeah, no, I knew. So like, here's another thing too. Like Brad did his homework. He took two programs 
and he used them to prepare for the test. And, and Kokoro Camp was the test in 2015. So, like, he goes there. Um, great story. You have your white shirt. You got your name on the front and the back. And um, it's just, it was just the whole imagery um, throughout the whole process for me was literally felt like you were in boot camp. And the one thing you you said that it was in the book again, this is a, right after you started. I can't remember the exact page. It was towards the beginning, though. Is you 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 said this question in there? When's the last time you ever did anything like really hard? When's the last time you ever over? I'm sorry, overdid anything? And if you can't answer it, then you probably have been living in a world of mediocrity your whole life. And I was like, damn, that's good. That's good. <laughs> I'm like, man, and it's true though. Brad, it is so true. Dude, and, that was me. It was me before I. That's why I signed yeah. up because I, I just I felt like I had been playing small ball my entire life. Uh, was was playing it safe, playing it by the rules, and it's like, man, I gotta, I gotta do something, man. I gotta have something on this life resume I can go back to, like some some big experience, you know. And that that was it for me. You know, I think when you made that decision of conviction that that was it. I'm I'm just throwing. All the cards on the table. I'm putting it out there. I'm going to give 100% effort to go through this Kokoro camp and let wherever the chips may fall, right? And I remember then there, there was a conversation between you and your dad before you went, and it was just beautiful. And it was almost like I was, again, I kept putting myself in your shoes and, and seeing my father there and saying, like, I'm going to be proud of you, son. You've been working your ass off. And whatever happens, happens. But just know I'm damn proud of you. And you were in the soldier mode. And I bet you a million bucks you mm -hmm. were just locked in like the Terminator, ready Dude. to go. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember that conversation with my dad. And then I remember the conversation with my wife the day before mm -hmm. I left. And I literally told her, I said, look, because um, she knows how committed I was to this. I was mm -hmm. living and breathing this thing for six months. It's all I, it's all I was trained to, towards, singular focus. And I looked at her and I said, look, um, I'm not going to quit out there i know i'm not gonna quit so i was like there's two ways i'm coming back i was like i'm coming back um either because i got hurt which can happen mm -hmm. i'm mm -hmm. coming back on my shield which is a reference from the movie Spartan. 300 which means mm -hmm. like i'm i'm gone right like totally gassed out i'm dead basically and she did she didn't know how to take it i was, I was that serious about making it and i think you have to be um if you're if you're taking this stuff serious if, you, if you're in a you know, a crucible such as that, you, you're going to break. You are going to break. Mm -hmm. You're going to break countless times. So, like, what are you going to go to when well, um, when you get when you get broken? You know what I mean? Over and over and over. What are you going to think about? Where does your mind go? When yep. you're training, and this is a great this is a great point to talk about because for my training as well, from doing ultra marathons. Um, what it does is when you go through a goal to a goal and you plan and you prep, it's not just physical. It's, it's the mental piece too, which mm -hmm. is way more important. So briefly, this happened exactly like you were talking about. I know in ultra races, I know you've done some too, that you get to, you know, you're going to get to a point where you're like, I know I'm going to say, why am I doing this? Or this hurts. Should I give up? So I did 100K on Saturday, and halfway through, I changed my socks to my shoes. And I got up, and I couldn't put pressure on my foot. It Like someone hit me with a hammer on my ankle. And I'm like, oh, this is it. This is the period. I said, what do I do? I go, I know what to do. If I could just start walking, let's just start with that. And I said, I know it's not easy. I mean, I mean, literally like in shooting pain. So as I start walking, I just prayed like, Lord, let this just be gone for me. Like, please just seems like you, and we'll talk about that, but you, I, you pray for the suffering to end so you can continue the journey to the goal. Right? right. So it took about a mile or two and I'm not saying it was gone by any means, but it wasn't that, that pain that it was just, I mean, mind numbing. So, I look forward to those. <laughs> this is crazy saying this, but you look forward to those points in, in a race or that crucible you go through in, in your training, and it it shapes you because you're not going to die. You know, you just keep moving forward. So that analogy of what I just said and what you went through, 
and for everyone listening, we're trying to relate this to you. What did you do or what have you done in your life where you had to make the decision? Do I quit on the goal I committed to? Right? Or do I press forward to the finish line? And if you can't answer that question, if you've never been there, then you haven't really done anything uncomfortable enough to find out who you really are. And go ahead, add on that, because I know you got a lot to say. Oh, dude, there's there's a million things going through my head there. But what, what you just, well, for one, kudos for doing 100K, because that's amazing. But uh, you're right. I, I think a lot of us um, folks out there that, that do these events, let's call them, or, or whatever, we want that. Like, I want to get to that point where I, I want to quit. I want I want to, like, because I'm hurting so bad, or mentally I'm just not in this anymore. Because to me, that's where the real training begins. Everything that led up to that was easy. And so every time I get to that point, whether it's, um, you know, a CrossFit workout, let's say, uh, you know, I'll, I'll run, whatever that is, um, studying for a test, preparing for a speech. When I get to that point of, man, I'm, I'm starting to question stuff. Good. That, that I know I'm on the right track. That's where I want to be. And this is where we forge our character. And it's, it's pretty easy. You can quit or give up and retreat, or you can just push forward. Because I do think there's, uh, and I'm trying to be careful with words, because um, I think quitting is different than giving up. Mm -hmm. Um, I've quit lots of things in my life for good reason. Relationships, um, classes, (laughs) you know, you name it. It just wasn't the right, you know, you get in and things change, right? Not the right fit anymore. So, you know, it's okay to quit, um, which is kind of hard to say sometimes. It's not okay to give up, though. And then the difference I draw there is giving up when, when you're giving up on something that um, you just kind of feel it in your soul, you know, like, mm-hmm. like that's what, that's where it's like, no, man, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not giving up on this. Like, no, like my family, for instance, like no way, no way I'm giving up on my wife. No way am I giving up on my kids, you know, that sort of thing. And that's what, that's what, um, it was really special about you when I was diving through your book and there's, there's a line in there that I got to get to it real quick. It's so good. Um, that you talked about your, your, here it is that you used visualization techniques when you were in the pain cave, whether you were thinking about quitting and just packing it in and your visualization techniques were your kids and your wife and the focus on them instead of the pain during your evolutions. So go, go talk about how important that is the visualization technique and, and the why of the purpose of what you're doing it for. Yeah. Visualization I'm a huge fan of. And uh, one of the big reasons I use it is to see yourself being successful before you actually start doing it or um, in, in the book, famous book art of war um Mm -hmm. victorious warriors see themselves winning on the battlefield before setting foot on the battlefield well for us the battlefield not for everybody but for most of us the battlefield's life so see yourself being successful so way you can use this is in the morning um you know take five minutes that's all you need really five minutes maybe ten I'd say 10, five, five minutes probably get you in that zone, but I'd say a good 10 minutes and just see yourself um, being successful that day. Like pick one thing. Like if I could just boil it down to this one thing, I got to get this one thing done, done today at work. See yourself actually doing it and get it done. Mm-hmm. And you do that over and over and over again. It, it is uh, super powerful because then you can use that same technique um, on anything really. Um, but I especially like using it for, uh, events crucibles things that are very physical very mentally challenging and i'll see myself um getting to that point of failure and then and then pushing through and and really think it like get granular with it like what am i going to be thinking about like i heard someone gave me an awesome tip um and maybe you've heard of this john because you you run ultras but uh people who run it came from an ultra runner um she writes um some uh, someone on her arm every hour mm-hmm that she wants to think about for that hour so they, she can focus on them and, and look at her arm. And I'm like, beautiful. That's exactly what I'm talking about. You know, how cool is it to just look down and then visualize that person? Like I'm running for you right now. You might not know it, but I know it. 
and it gives you energy, which is kind of crazy to think, but it does. Mm-hmm. Uh, absolutely it does, does g- give you, give you energy. And I, I used it. I did a, uh, um, I did a half marathon with a buddy of mine <clears throat> and this was last weekend. We got to about awesome. mile 10 and, uh, that's when I started hurting about mile 10 mm-hmm. and he was with me and he just, he noticed, I just started going. He's like, what happened dude around that mile? I like, I, I pictured my wife and kids there and I thought, man, what would they be thinking if they saw me, you know, wanting to just slow up and like, you know, hurt and like, no, 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 I'm, I'm going, I'm going for them right now. You know, why it's so funny, dude, this is crazy. I mean, how many coming out? There's so many common things that we've, they always say when when people are cut from the same cloth, like that, that fabric is so tight and tightly woven together of your value system and your, you know, your character. And during my race this weekend was, um, my wife always says like, you know, sometimes you, I understand, I don't understand completely why you do it, but just remember you take time away from the family. So we had a party that night and, um, very scheduled, intentional of like every, every loop was 10 miles. So I knew like what I needed to have to get it done so that I could be home so we can go to the party and drive there as a family. So as points in the race where I'm like, dude, I'm kind of slowing down, you know, I kept thinking to myself, what did I say I was going to do today? I committed to be home at a certain time. (laughs) And that was my fuel. That's it. it was to honor her and my family that we wouldn't miss out on an event with all the people from our, our church and our, our parish and our community. And it wasn't about being there with them. It was about being there with my family and being, being present with them and not taking a race, which means really nothing in the, in the grand scheme of things. Because as a father, it's, that's way more important as a role and as a husband. So It's so funny you say these things because we both are in alignment with our why and our why is deeply rooted in our our wives and our children because we represent as fathers have this opportunity to be an example, a loving, supportive, strong, bold, fierce competitor. Really, it's true. And we need more of that in this in the society instead of passivity and letting others do things while they sit on the bench, right, and watch the world just burn in front of them. We need to step in the gap. So I was my sorry, I'm not soapbox, no, but it. man, it's so true. Get in the game. That's right. You know? I love it. So man, this is going well. It's I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to have part two just to go in Kokoro. We can do a part two, man. It's all good. I, I got as much time as you need. Yeah, I just I don't want I don't I don't want people to miss the uh, intensity uh, of your um, your crucible at Kokoro. Um, the one thing before I leave, actually, I, I, we're gonna we're gonna do a part two because I, okay, I want to just give... do that. We'll do a part two. That sounds good. Sound good? Yeah, yeah. But before for sure. we end, before we end today, I want everyone to, to just remember this: that an easy day that you said this an easy day and I would not let fear take over my thoughts again. So as we started with fear, you know, there are no easy days. Like someone has it worse than you. And I want to mm-hmm. just conclude on this because I really feel like the topic today was fear and um, also overcoming that and, and taking action and being fulfilled in your purpose. But tell everyone as we conclude, like, what they need to do in order to make that shift, that pivot in their life to really just take action to be the man or woman that they need to be. Yeah. And I don't know if there's just one particular thing that's going to work for every, everybody. I think it's a combination of several things Uh, because it was for me, but you know, one thing is, is to take time for yourself. I mean, um, self care is not selfish. So I'll say it again. Self-care is not selfish. If you're not um, filling your own cup, how are you going to show up at your best for everybody else? What am I talking about there? I'm talking about, you know, trying to eat good. Maybe not be perfect, but try to eat good. Try to move whatever your jam is. Not everybody has to be a CrossFitter or an ultra runner or whatever, dude. You do you. 
Walking's great. I think it's one of the most underrated things ever. I walk a ton with my wife and I love it. Um, but that, that's a way that it helps me to um, show up and kind of fill my cup so I can show up for my kids and all that good stuff. Um, and then the, I would say that'd be number one, self-care. Number two would be um, do some soul searching. Try to figure out what you think you're here to do. And if you can't come up with it, don't worry. At least you're starting to think about it. And then ask ask your friends, ask family members, like, hey, what do what do I have? Like, what are some of my superpowers? I think it's hard for people to really uh, think of their own on their own. So ask someone who's close to you, like, hey, what do you think I'm really good at? That's probably going to start leading you kind of down that path of maybe where you should be operating. And then um, three would be get a uh, get a mentor, get a coach, get a friend, get an accountability partner that you can just talk to about it, man. Like you, you know, and they're gonna they're gonna listen to you. They're gonna give advice. And then four is just go do it, man. I mean, you you have to take action. And if you fail, don't worry about it, man. I hope you fail. Actually, I do, because that at least means you're getting off the X and you're trying to do something, and then learn from it pivot, figure it out, do it again, and then do it again. And then you'll you'll eventually get there. I mean, if you've got that work ethic we were talking about earlier, and it's coming from a place of, uh, you know, it's genuine, it's heartfelt, it's of service to others, like, dude, it's going to happen, man. Like, it's just a matter of time. So there you go. No, that, dude, those are perfect points. And the one thing I would tell people with all those points that you gave is it takes time. Like no matter what change is going to occur in your life, that if you want your dreams to become realities, you you have to put in the work, you know, you have to do self-care. You have to literally look at everything holistically, but then break it down to a micro level. Um, one of the things that I would, I would advise everyone to read is Napoleon Hill, uh, Think and Grow Rich. Um, there's a great, on page 40, well, the, the version I had, where it literally gives you the list of how to manifest what you want to happen in your life. And you have to do that twice a day. So it, it sits on the subconscious and you start working on those actionable steps to your fulfillment of what you're destined to do in life. And I, I believe everyone was born with gifts, just like you said earlier. It's just how do you tap into those gifts? And it's like that fuel with it wouldn't align with your passion and then you go and do good for for others using those and at the end of the day like you leave that legacy for your family and both of us are so rooted deeply in that value system and if every person could do that then everyone gets better we all win so brad this has been great man i really look forward to uh oh yeah i love it john part part <laughs> Coming at I, well, <laughs> this doesn't happen. I'm going to be honest, Brad. This doesn't happen very often where okay. I do I do a split it into two. But um, I think it's the right thing. And I hope everyone uh, was able to be with us the whole time and, and get deeper next time into the, the challenges and adversities you went through at, at oh, well, Kokoro we'll, we'll get into the guts of the book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you'll, you'll, uh, yeah, I'll share some stories. I'll share some stories that aren't even in the book. So how about that? Awesome. Yeah. Well. Brad, again, thank you for your time tonight. Um, I'm just so appreciative of uh, meeting you online and through our, our the podcast and uh, through Javier Mesa. Thank you again, Javier, Shout for out bringing to us Ron together. Jalapeno. That's what I call him. That's right. It's my man. <laughs> oh, that's great, man. So, hey, everyone, be blessed, be good. This class is dismissed. <laughs>